On the 7th of September, Citizen Lab announced the discovery of a new iOS Zero Day getting actively exploited in the wild. Apparently, the entry point for this vulnerability was a passkit attachment. These passkits are basically these tickets you can have in your iPhone wallet. And so the victim probably was sent an iMessage, iOS parses the passkit attachment, which then included an image and the phone got hacked. Of course, Citizen Lab contacted Apple to report their findings. And on the same day of the press release, we also got an iOS update. Processing a malicious crafted image may lead to arbitrary code execution. A few days later, we also got an update from Chrome reporting that a critical heap buffer overflow was reported in their image format WebP. At the time, the bug report details were still restricted, but it was clear that there was an issue with the image format WebP. And finally, it was confirmed here. When looking at the WebP commits, there were changes related to fix out of bound write in build Huffman table. So what we have here is a very critical vulnerability in an image file format used by iOS and Chrome. And with these two code bases, we basically already cover the world. But if you now think you are safe because you use Android and Firefox, well, obviously Firefox is also affected and so is Android. Image parsing with image magic on the web server, also vulnerable. Any software that supports WebP most likely uses the official WebP library and that's where the vulnerability lies. So I don't think it's exaggerated to say that this was one of the most valuable vulnerabilities that could exist. Looking at the prices for zero days, of course a full chain, the single vulnerability is not enough, but this WebP vulnerability could be the entry point for any of these categories. This is an insane vulnerability that existed in the source code since 2014. And that alone makes it interesting to look at. But this is not the only fascinating thing about it because if it's a vulnerability that could be used to exploit so many different projects, why have we not seen any full example exploit for any target? Why is it that we only have some proof of concept web P files that trigger the overflow, but nothing more? Well, this is the start of a small mini series where I want to share with you everything I learned about this vulnerability. And in this first video, I will try to explain the general concept of WebP and the cause for this overflow. In the second video, we will then dive into the question of fuzzing. How can we set up fuzzing and could we have found this holy grail of a vulnerability ourselves? And then finally, we look closer at the code and try to reason about the discovery process. So let's start with the first video. And I guess if I would have to summarize it, this video is about why you should study computer science and pay attention to your data structures and algorithm classes. This video is sponsored by our training platform, hextree.io. More on that later. Probably the best article written about this vulnerability is by Ben Hawkeys. And this was obviously also one of the main resources I started with. So let's see what he was able to learn from the public security patch. The vulnerability is in the lossless compression support for WebP. To achieve this, WebP used an algorithm called Huffman coding. Although Huffman coding is conceptually based on a tree data structure, modern implementations have been optimized to use tables instead. The patch suggests that it was possible to overflow the Huffman table when decoding an untrusted image. The vulnerable version uses memory allocations based on pre-calculated buffer sizes from a fixed table and will then construct the Huffman tables directly into that allocation. Okay, it sounds like in order to understand this vulnerability, we need to understand lossless compression and specifically Huffman codes. I guess we have to brush up on some computer science algorithms and data structure knowledge. When I want to learn something, the biggest issue I face is the unknown unknowns. There's just so much information hidden that I struggle to even pose the right question. So usually I try to get a broader understanding of a topic first because then hopefully I will also start to recognize what I don't know and I can specifically seek out the answers. So I went on YouTube and I just typed in Huffman codes, trying to understand the bigger picture. And we can quickly find a video by Tom Scott and then also found these videos by Reducible, Huffman codes and information theory perspective and how BNG works, compromising speed for quality. And specifically, the latter one was very helpful to me. While it's about PNG, it's not unreasonable to assume that WebP being a newer format built upon the concepts from something like PNG. Anyway, 
From the Tom Scott video, we can learn the basics how data can be compressed with Huffman codes. And it's kind of simple. You first perform a frequency analysis of symbols, which means in the case of text, we take each character as a symbol and count how many times it is seen and create an ordered list of them. And then we can start with the least common characters or symbols and start building a tree structure. The character 0 and 1 is only seen once, so together they make up the smallest subtree with their sum 2. Then we have character M with two occurrences, so we can combine them into a new subtree, their sum being 4. And now we keep going until we get a complete tree. The tree can be used to compress data, but let's talk about the decompression case. Let's say we transmit this tree and then the compressed bits 11000 then the receiver can decode it. We start reading the bits and a one means right tree and zero left. So right, right, left, left, and we reach the symbol W, which means we successfully compressed an ASCII character W, usually encoded in ASCII eight bits, down to just five bits. So that's Huffman codes and Huffman trees explained. And then from watching Reducibles videos, going a bit more in depth and learning about some clever ideas how an image could be compressed, most important to me was the fact that PNG compresses each color into its own separate Huffman codes and tree. Because I have read this about WebP as well. So we might even talk about multiple trees and a tree for red, blue and green pixel values. And well, after watching all these videos, I felt like I understood the basics of Huffman codes and how this lossless compression relates to an image file format. But I was still confused about the Huffman tables. All resources just talk about Huffman trees, but the vulnerability is about overflowing the Huffman tables. So I was asking myself, where did I see tables? First, I thought it must be the symbol frequency table. How often a symbol appears? And looking at some Huffman code homework exercises, we see such tables often created. But I don't think it's that table. It didn't make much sense to me for two reasons. First of all, a table with a list of symbols is unlikely to overflow. We know how many symbols there are. Color values go from 0 to 255, 8-bit. So we know this encoding table must always have 255 entries. How would that overflow? And the second reason I thought this was weird was that a table like this is not really efficient. Do you have to loop through the table for every bit to find the matching code? This is especially inefficient because this code can have different lengths depending on how deep the tree goes. So something didn't add up. So I kept researching a bit more, maybe also asked JetGPT, and eventually I stumbled over this Stack Overflow article. This one cleared up one confusion about the efficiency of the tables. Let's say we have these codes. Basically, this is how the tree would look like. A is straight to the left and B is right left and so forth. If we want to put this now into an efficient table, we just create a list of three bit indices, three bit, because it's the longest one. And now we can decode the data. We always take three bits, literally use that as a number offset into the table, 0, 1, 0, this line. You can see the A is expanded to many rows because we know only one bit is required for the A, the zero. So we essentially ignore all the other ones, meaning we can slide it over by one bit to the next three and we get 101. That's a binary five, so we can go straight to the table offset and it's a B, consuming two bits. And so when I read that, I started to feel like I understand why this table could overflow. The length of this table depends on the bits of the longest code. And so A in this table was not just one entry, it got expanded to all three bit codes starting with zero. So if you could provide input that leads to a Huffman table with very long bit codes, the table would explode in size. That sounded logical and it's kind of the idea of this vulnerability. But this cannot be the full story. It would be easy to craft a tree so that the maximum code length gets longer and longer. So developers could never be certain about a maximum table size. And when reading the vulnerability description, the simple explanation didn't explain that. There must be more complex logic behind it. The purported maximum size for a symbol size of 40 with a root table of 8 bits and a maximum code length of 15 is 410. Or also the comment in the source code, fixed table size values computed for 8-bit first level lookup. What? How does that fit into that table understanding? So I had to ask somebody. And eventually, after talking to Misty Mountain Corp on Twitter, it clicked for me. I found the missing link. They wrote, 
Each Huffman lookup table can have a second level table to prevent the table from becoming too big. So this links our understanding of these tables being able to grow, but also that developers are aware of that. So that's why they use layers of tables in practice. They also shared this article explaining this more. The gzip approach is to introduce a special marker on these two long entries that tells the inflating code that the entry is a pointer to another lookup table. This way you prevent the size from exploding and you still get the speed of direct table offsets. And that's why it's used in practice in various places, including WebP Huffman tables. And if we now go back to the WebP source code, we can finally understand where the hard-coded table sizes come from. Apparently, this is the result from running a tool called enough.c. All values computed for 8-bit first level lookup. Let's run this tool with some of the parameters mentioned here. So the first table used, for example, for the color red will cover 256 symbols. Those are our 256 different possible color values. The question, how many bits for the root table, the first table? This will be 8 bits. But can the second table still explode in size? No, we only support a max code length of 15 bits. These are our parameters and this tool now performs an exhaustive search, so a brute force to find the maximum possible table size when compressing data. In this case, we get the result 630. So we have 630 as a table size for red, blue and the alpha pixel channel. 630 three times. And then we also have this distance value and that only has 40 symbols, which results in a size of 410. There's still one color channel missing, the green channel. This is special because it depends on some color cache size value. No clue what that means, but it's a bit larger. 256 symbols for the color plus 24 length prefix plus color cache size. And that's how you get the 654 here. And the other ones are respectively the color cache sizes 2, 4, 8, 16 and so forth. Anyway, after seeing that, I kind of understood some core facts about the WebP implementation of the Huffman tables. This fixed table size is not just the size of one Huffman code table. It covers five different Huffman trees for red, blue, alpha, distance and green plus color cache. And each of these five Huffman code tables consists of actually two different tables, the root table and the second level table. And they are all managed and allocated in one big memory chunk. Let's peek into the source code. Here we can see that the K table size array is used based on the color cache bits to determine the maximum table size. And then later this one huge table is allocated and passed into read Huffman code. Here a comment says that the code length array is used to create the Huffman tree or the Huffman table. So keep that in mind, that array will become important. But let's first follow the path of the table buffer. This table is then passed to VP8L build Huffman table along the code length buffer and then it calls build Huffman table. And in here is where the heap overflow finally happens. But how is the table now constructed? Let's think about this. The table represents a Huffman tree, right? Each image that we compress will have different pixel values or symbols, so the Huffman tree shape depends on the frequency of the symbols in the input. And the tree shape then determines the Huffman code bit lengths. And these bit lengths then determine the table size. If we know there's one symbol with a bit length 1, one with a bit length 2, and two with a bit length 3, we know symbol 1 requires 4 entries, symbol 2 requires 2 entries, and the other require 1. This means the code length information is all we need to construct a table. And maybe you have already guessed that is exactly the role of the code length array. This array simply stores for each symbol the code length. And if we look at where this data is actually coming from, we see that it's basically coming straight from the WebP file. Here this array is created and we can see it's using VP8L read bits, which is a helper function to read bits from the file. There's also another Huffman table involved. I believe this is to compress that array as well, but not that important. Let's again go to the place where then the table is built. There is a first step where we loop over all the entries of it, constructing a new array called count, which has 15 entries, that is the max allowed bit length. So we know each entry in the code length array is representing a symbol and their Huffman code bit length. So if we, for example, look at the table with 40 symbols, it will be 40 entries long. So this loop now goes through each symbol and looks at the length of the Huffman code for the symbol to increment a counter how many symbols of a certain length exist. 
example, let's say a symbol one has length two, then the Huffman code has two bits, then we increment the count array at position two. Symbol two maybe has a five bit Huffman code, so we increment count five. The result is a count array with 15 entries, and it tells us how many code symbols have a certain bit length. And this count array is then used to construct the table. At least that's what I think the next code here is doing, because to be honest, I haven't really tried to understand that code, but I'm pretty sure. And now pay attention, because here comes the mental aha moment for me. I don't think it's obvious at first, but after spending countless of hours trying to understand this, I realized something. There's a huge difference between creating this table or array during compression and now creating it again during decompression. Hold my mate, let me show you. Let's imagine an invalid table where four symbols have a bit length one. The tree representation of that makes no sense. You have one bit zero and one, you could encode two symbols, but you cannot do the other two. Obviously, such a tree does not exist, right? But in the code length array, in the webp file, we could encode that. We could say that there's a symbol one, two, five, and seven, and they have all the bit length one, which is leading to a nonsensical count array. According to this example, we have four symbols with length one, and that can never exist. And yet we use this value to construct the table in memory. And now I think you can get a feeling for the problem. The pre-calculated hard-coded table size are based on input to be compressed. In that case, we always generate valid trees and thus nice tables. That's why we can use the tool enough.c to calculate the maximum table size that could ever happen. But on the decompression side, when we try to create our table from this data, we can create nonsensical tables and they might be larger than expected. But how can we figure now out how to craft these values for such a table? Well, maybe your next question is, if these tables are directly constructed from the image file, and I'm sure a fuzzer will throw lots of invalid table information at the file, could we find this vulnerability with fuzzing? Let's talk about this next video. If you like this video and you want to learn more about hacking, please check out hextree.io. This is an online training platform developed by Stack Smashing and me, and we try to create the best video tutorials to learn hacking. It's a lot of work and we are not fully public that, but we are eventually getting there. So I would appreciate it if you check out hextree.io. And if you would like to support Live Overflow videos directly, check out my font at shop.liveoverflow.com. It's definitely a shitty present to yourself or people you hate. And besides that, maybe also consider becoming a Patreon or YouTube member. Their financial support is very appreciated. Thanks and see you soon.